Hello, and thanks for joining us for another episode of Mid-American Gardener. I'm your host, Tanisha Spain, and this is our stay-at-home edition of the show that we've been doing for the last few months. Uh, of course, we've got our experts on the line to answer your questions that you've sent in. Uh, so I will let them introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about their specialty and what they're into in the garden. So uh, Jen, we'll start with you. Hi, I'm Jen Nelson. I'm a horticulturalist and you can find me online at groundedandgrowing.com. I am pretty well a generalist, but if I had to pick some favorites, I would say vegetable gardening, uh, house plants, especially orchids, uh, and just general landscape questions. Okay, wonderful. And Marty? Hi, I'm uh, Marty Alanya. Um, I'm a retired landscaper, did that quite a long time. Grew up in a family with an enormous garden and yard and <clears throat> pretty, oh, you know, it's in my, I think if I stood too long on the bare earth, I'd just grow roots and get in there. So um, uh, I have some experience. I like uh, perennials the most, shrubs, really the home garden, um, mm -hmm. small, smaller landscapes. Um, but nobody ever hired me to do 80 acres, but I, you know, I would have. You know, so. <laughs> that would have been anyway. a job, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. A lot of, lot so, of lawn. I think we'd have a lot of expansive lawn there. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Okay. So, uh, Jen, we usually start out with show and tell. So, uh, Jen, sure. you've got something that you wanted to share today. Yes. Um, straight out of my backyard. I went outside this morning and I noticed an awful lot of, these are leaves from our river birch. We have three clumps of river birch in the backyard, kind of all in the mm -hmm. same area. And there's enough leaves on the ground this morning that I could get a rake and rake them up. And the first time I saw this uh, years ago, I freaked out uh, because it's July. It shouldn't be losing so many leaves, but it's also very, very hot out and we're getting into kind of a um, dry conditions. And so this is what birch trees do when it gets too dry out. They just kind of cut their losses. And we had a really, really wet spring so the, there's a lot, a lot of leaves on those trees. And it's, uh, to my knowledge, not going to hurt it. It's been doing this for years. And I freak out a little bit, I will admit, even though I know it's going to be fine, it's all going to be fine. Um, but it does look rather um, sudden to walk out the back door and see this. Uh, but uh, maybe Marty's got got some commentary on this. If she's seen it too. But um it just, that's just what it does. And that's it just trying to sort of readjust to the mm -hmm. conditions. I have uh, two river birches and one is in a much more shaded roots, a um, little bit lower grade position than the other. And the one I, the one that's by the driveway whose shade I park in, if I don't go in my new garage, um, it was really suffering. I can look at it out my window right now. Um, the whole west side of it didn't seem as though it was going to leaf out this year. But then it did. It's sparse. And I'm thinking, well, it was really dry last summer. Mm -hmm. And it was a dry mm -hmm. fall. And I think, well, you know, hindsight being 2020, I probably should have watered it a little more. Um, and now, since it hasn't rained for a few weeks, even though it's supposed to today, um, you know, if it doesn't, I think I'm going to start putting the hose out there and just let it trickle for an hour or two. Just yeah. Is this something that. that you see in other trees or is this specific to this type of tree? I think my, other my trees crab do will it. do this. Mm -hmm. hmm, okay. I've never seen it so dramatic as with the birch. I mean, other trees will do it to some extent, but this is just like, Oh, is it fall? I mean, <laughs> and these yeah. are next. And mine are next to a retention pond. So I don't think of them as oh, yeah. being water stressed, but it is no. um, kind of a slope up from the pond. So maybe it, maybe it's, it's enough of a difference from what they're used to. I mean, it's been really wet where they're, where they are in my yard and it's for once it's actually drying out probably the first time since, you know, April. <laughs> so maybe it is a stress. Yeah. yeah. Maybe it is a stress on them in, in a relative sense. But the health of the tree is not in any sort of jeopardy or anything? No, this is the same tree that is destroying my vegetable garden by growing roots up into all my raised beds. So it's, oh. it's alive and well. I'm not. It's really a love-hate really. relationship, right? <laughs> you know it. You know it. They are, they are beautiful, but 
Mm-hmm. You're in my garden. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you, Jen. So, Marty, we're going to go to you for a question. Uh, this okay. one is uh, number 910 from Anna, and she writes in about her roses. Um, first, she says, thank you for answering my question regarding a privacy shrub on a previous episode. You all are immensely helpful, and I've been exploring your suggestions. Now on to the rose question. Um, we have an awful battle with an infestation of insects on the foliage of our rose bushes this spring. The leaves were basically decimated, leaving a mere stem and fewer blossoms. Is there a product that is as effective as seven that does not leave an unsightly residue on the plant? So that's the first question. Below the okay. shank on some of our knockout roses, the bases are getting larger and larger. Do roses typically fizzle out after a number of years? We've had them for about 12 to 14. So insect control and lifespan <clears throat> of a rose bush. Yeah. Um, and um, knockouts in particular. I, I love knockout roses. I, I particularly like the originals because mm-hmm. they're fragrant and the devils, the devils sacrifice petal number for fragrance. And I love the, the smell. They're kind of raspberry, fruity. I love them. But they do, they will get really large. On the, I saw the picture that, we, that the, the question was accompanied by. Um, I, I have noticed they will do that. Um, I, would, I would recommend that they mulch them a little more. Um, and maybe they wouldn't get as much dieback that they felt like they had to cut back. Because I noticed that the the root the the crown in the picture was cut back pretty severely, and it had several places, several shoots, some of them pretty large that had been removed. So um, I would I would be inclined to say make sure you water a little bit in the summer, and um, don't cut them back until spring when you see new growth coming on. And you might be able to get some canes to get larger and because if they overwinter, which some of them surely should, with a little extra water, a little extra mulch. Um, you also might um, just wait till they break dormancy in the spring, your, your shoots from the last year. If you have anything that survives the winter, wait till that breaks dormancy and then cut it back if you think you need to. Mm-hmm. You know, reduce it by no more than a third or so and see if you can get some bigger growth, bigger, you know, larger stems on there and you might not have so much dieback. Now, as to the to the insecticide question, I hate using seven. Um, seven is broad spectrum and it kills everything. It's particularly toxic to bees. I hate using it. It's <laughs> toxic <laughs> Um, uh, there's, I can't, Jen, can you think of anything? I mean, really seven is effective, but man, uh, you might, I don't, I think malathion also kills bees. Um, it's, it's an older, mm-hmm. uh, insecticide, but it's, it's effective against a lot of things. Um, I would almost recommend maybe screening them. Uh, mm-hmm. like, uh, Japanese beetles are coming on right now in the summer. People have seen them on some things. Um, I mean, they're so small when it's insects, you have to practically use like a window screen or something on a frame, sure. uh, on a tomato cage or anything. But I, I don't know. I, it, if you can go, go, Jen, do you have any ideas? Listen, about by, the, by the description, it sounds like maybe Japanese beetles because she's saying that nothing's left. Stripped. Yeah. Yeah. Completely stripped. There yeah. was at one point, um, Bear was making a rose care. Um, that had a metacloprid in it, and it doesn't get into the flowers. From That's a, right. From what I remember, um, it's been it's a, a granular. I, yeah. Yeah, and you put it on once a year, and it lasts yep. for about six weeks. It lasts usually. Put it on before the Japanese beetles show up. That's the main okay. thing it defends against. Um, but I'd heard good things about it. I used it once, and it I. I I haven't had that much of a problem with Japanese beetles, and I know I'm completely jinxing myself by saying that on the show. <laughs> I said it. I said it on a radio interview yesterday too, so I know they are like hovering over my house. Right now. <laughs> I but I would thing. look. I would look for something like that. That was that might be. Um, it was called like Rose Care or something like that, and it had a fungicide in it as well. I think. 
But it kind yeah. of eliminates the issue about I'm with you about not harming the using the broad spectrums that harm mm -hmm. the pollinators and it, it yeah. being a systemic, it would only get the insects that have the audacity to chew on your plants and <laughs> that's right. get them out. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And so kind of in that same vein, Jen, we have another question from Paula that says, today I noticed Japanese beetles on my roses. How do I get rid of them without using seven? So <laughs> we had someone who liked using seven and now we have someone who doesn't want to use seven. So um, any other advice, any other applications that you can think of? Oh, sure. Um, if they really don't want to use anything at all, uh, you can always get the uh, the old bucket of soapy water trick and go out there in the morning or in the evening when the Japanese beetles are pretty well quieted down and they're usually kind of clustered up on the plant and knock them off into the soapy water. Uh, the earlier you can get after that, um, when they start feeding, the better because the more they feed on a plant, uh, it causes the plant to actually release chemicals that attract more Japanese beetles, like kind of saying, Ooh, free lunch, you know, come, come eat. <laughs> so the <laughs> more you can, the more you can stop the, um, the feeding uh, early on, the better. It's going to take some consistency though. And so she's going to have to decide whether she's got the time to go do that every day or not. I was just going to ask if that was something you had to do every day. Yep. Yep. And if you could convince, if you've got like, you know, child labor at home, that would yeah do it for you. <laughs> yes. In these quarantine times though, I'll tell you, my garden hasn't looked this good in years and it's because I've got the extra time. <laughs> yeah. There are no oh, yeah. Weeds, you know, so uh, I think, I think we all have a few extra minutes to go get some beetles and drop them into a bucket mm -hmm. uh, in the evening. Okay. Uh, let's see, Marty, we're back to you. Uh, 914. This is Gail. She writes in, um, I have some Asiatic lily bulbs and gladiola bulbs, bulbs that I bought recently on sale. Should I put them in now or hold off until next year? I think I, uh, I noticed the date on this question too. It was just like, uh, this, you know, oh, yeah. this was live yeah, now was or July June. Second. pretty recently. Yeah. Um, I'd stick them in now. You can replant, you can plant those right away. The glads you may get some uh, bloom on even this year yet. Um, the lilies may not bloom this year, but they will next year. If they have any growth on them now, uh, I would leave it on. Uh, if it has growth on it that's already bloomed, you might cut the growth back by about half or so um, on, the, on the lily only. And then um, be sure you mulch them well and give them plenty of water and those lilies those asiatics will uh establish this year and they should bloom fantastically for years to come mm -hmm. glad you're I gonna have, have to go, go okay, okay. i have some um hostas that i started from seed way way back in march and i still have them in little pots little cups um mm -hmm. and i was advised to wait a little bit longer until the root ball got a little bit bigger so what month when do you think would be a good time to get those hostas in the ground? I don't know. Wait a little I, longer. I yeah. I how if they're little, can you put them in like a like a two gallon pot or a one gallon pot, and Ooh. transfer them up so they can get a little bigger root system, and then you can set them out in like early September. I can do that. Uh, um, and and again, mulch them well, water them well. Hostas mm -hmm. are pretty tough, but they do need that that fibrous root mm -hmm. system. And I think they need a little bigger shoe there so you can get some okay. more root growth on them. From seed, you amaze me. From seed. <laughs> I love trying, like that's my biggest thing. If I can get something to you grow totally from seed, do. I feel like <laughs> it's it's like my drug. I love growing from seed. <laughs> <laughs> you do. So I will, uh, I'll get them some bigger shoes and maybe they'll, they'll take off. I'm trying to I cover... Know. Uh, I, there's a shady area under a tree that of course we just can't get anything to grow there. And so I thought, why not just plop a bunch of hostas under there and call it good. So I've got a corner like that. It's, it was sunny. Now it, I had berries in it. Now I have to move my raspberries and blackberries out toward the sun. And I'm going to fill that corner with the biggest hosta I got around the mm -hmm. yard, mm -hmm. transplant them over and stop mowing that. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Jen, we are back to you. Uh, yep. 917. This is from Lydia. My Japanese maple has sores all over it. I hope I can save it. Look forward to hearing from you. 
So yes, let's show this. We've got a graphic to go with this, I think, but um, I have seen this once before and uh, that's the only reason I knew what I think this might be. Um, maples have thin bark and so they can be, um, the bark can split because of environmental conditions. And so if the um, sw rapid swings in temperature, like from cold to warm, can cause that swelling and it to split. I've also seen it happen when we've gone from a droughty condition to uh, getting a bunch of rain. So I'm not sure what exactly triggered it with hers, but if you look closely at the pictures, you can see that there is a, a ca an edge, kind of a rounded edge that the tree is compartmentalizing and kind of walling off that wound and it's healing. So you shouldn't do anything to it. The temptation is like, oh, I want to paint something on there and I should want to, you know, seal it off, but just let the tree do what it does best and it will, it will heal itself. Um, it can be really dramatic with maples. When I saw this on a friend's tree, it was during the drought we had in 2012 and it was just regular healthy maple tree in her front yard. And one morning it just looked normal. And the next morning it had all these big splits in it and you could stick your pinky finger into it. And she was called me all frantic at, that her tree was dying, but it recovered yeah, and it's fine. It so yeah. when we talk before on other shows about like wounds in trees and we talk about mm -hmm. how insects can get in there and that could be a problem for something like this, when the tree is trying to heal itself up, do you still run the risk of oh, pests sure. getting in there and Absolutely. Absolutely. But the best thing you can do is just kind of watch and wait. And as long as you see that the tree is, is callousing over and, and healing itself, just keep an eye on that. Uh, if worse came to worse, if you saw a problem on a branch, you could all, always uh, prune that branch out. But as long as it's looking like there's no, um, nothing moving in, I don't think she needs to do anything. All right, we're going to Marty. Let's see. Uh, Carolyn writes in, I would like to transplant some beard tongue and allium plants. Can this be done in mid-July? If so, any tips you could provide would be appreciated. So another transplant question. Um, is it a good time or should she wait? It is. It is a good time typically, but in the temperatures we're having right now, which are hovering around 100 it's a teensy bit hard <laughs> on the plants. When, you know, typically, I would trans, I wouldn't transplant those things. I would cut them back. I'd cut any flower stems off the penstemon, and the allium. I'd probably cut flower stems off of that as well. Um, I mean, allium. Come on, it's 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 just almost indestructo. But you may want to wait till the temperature cools a little bit outside. It's pretty hot. Um, Ordinarily, like I said, ordinarily, I'd say, yeah, uh, water them really well and get, you know, don't dally between the time you dig them up out of the ground and you move them over here. But it is really brutally hot right now. So, uh, you know, when the when the temperature is more like, you know, a high of 90 instead of 99. <laughs> <laughs> and again, <laughs> mulch them, you know, water them uh, and you. Cut them back, move them quickly. Make sure you make the hole big enough. That's a big deal when you're transplanting. The soil in the on the root ball needs to meld seamlessly with the soil in the hole. So make the hole half again as wide as the as the transplant root ball, mm -hmm. and loosen the soil around it. Don't make it any deeper, just wider, so those little roots can go out and and grab a hold of sweet mother earth before it freezes. That's what they're doing. So yeah, just water and mulch and yeah, but I, I'd probably wait maybe another, I don't know, just watch the weather. If it's, if it cools off a little bit, get a storm front through and it cools off, go crazy. Mm -hmm. 90 or below. Is that your advice? <laughs> I would. I mean, unless you, unless you absolutely had to, I mean, if the high, the high is like 90, 92, but not 99 when, when the temperature is like close to hundred, Everything's drought, you know, everything is heat stressed. It's mm -hmm. just like, holy smokes, it's warm out here. You know, they 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 lose moisture uh, through their leaves much more quickly because it's hot. Yeah. So when you water transplants, water the foliage too. Just water the snot out of them, you know, you know, 
So soak them, drown them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Rain, rain on them. <laughs> so. Okay, Jen. Anything be, to add to that? Fringy. Yeah, I would second everything that Marty said. And, you know, it's hard on us as gardeners, too. And we kind of forget that. And so I'm finding my it's if you can do that transplanting um, in the evening and mm -hmm. give that plant the entire night to at least start to recover, I, that would be my suggestion, too. It's not necessarily a, a morning job. Um, it's, it's still going to be stressed. It's still going to be, be in shock over the transplant, but at least you can give it a little bit of a, a um, gentle um, transition. <laughs> Not soften. in the scorching, burning sun of yeah. you know, the midday. <laughs> soften the blow a little bit. There you go. There you go. Okay. All right. We're going back to, well, I'll just throw this one out there generally. Um, this is a question about magnolia trees. My 20 year old magnolia has some sort of white growth on the smaller branches, pictures attached. I've never noticed this in past years. Can you tell me what it is? And if I should be concerned for the tree, the tree is also dripping a lot of sap this year. It flowered as normal in the spring hearing. So she's the got a couple growth. things she's seeing here. Uh, let's see the white growth and the sap. The white growth look like mealybugs to me in the picture. Did you see that one, Jen? Yeah, and I mean the scale wise, could it also be oyster scale on Magnolia? That was my I, first I thought when I I don't know why they wouldn't get it, but that'd account for the sap. I didn't see the scale, but I sure did see mealybugs. Mealybugs, yeah. okay. Either one would produce um honeydew, wouldn't they, Marty? And that would be the the sap that she's talking about, maybe. I'm I'm trying to remember if mealybugs I I never yeah, see, now you're going to get, now I'm going to get an infestation of something too. I don't get yes. those in my garden. I just, I don't get, those are usually like house plant bugs. Yeah, so, I've, I've yeah. never seen mealy bugs outside. That's why I was thinking oyster scale on magnolia. Maybe you're right. Maybe they're moving right. It's a little late for them to be moving though, isn't it? But yeah, that would, I don't that know. Would do it. Well, in that case, she's going to have to use a systemic insecticide. Mm hmm that okay. that you usually it's a granular and mm -hmm. you sprinkle it around the base like we were talking about with the roses get up go to your garden center tell them what you think you're looking at um uh, like jen was saying uh, um, those come in broad spectrum and they don't injure the the pollinators of course you kind of passed it with the magnolia now but still and all it's still out there right mm -hmm. so you sprinkle it around the base of the tree usually i go from the trunk to the drip line and just use the recommended rate. It'll usually show you a little grid on there. And it'll take a little time, water it mm -hmm. in, but the, the tree will take that insecticide up in its roots and anything feeding or sucking on it, like the scale or mealybugs or whatever those wind up being, will die. <laughs> <laughs> we all my live happily when I did it. That's right, yeah. Adios, so you don't think the you. tree itself is actually dripping sap or, or weeping? No. You think it's actually a byproduct of the, the mealybugs? Of the, the, of the, the scale, yeah, this bug. The, scale. the insects yeah, I, are causing damage that make it drip. I would like guess technically it's technically it is sap, but honeydew is sap that has passed through. A yeah, creature. not the sap we want. Oh, <laughs> no. It's like not extra that kind of sap. Yeah, ants <laughs> like it. So after you do, after you do a treatment like that, how long will, how long until you can see results and will you have to go out there and pick off or is there cleanup involved? You know, will it kill them and they just fall off or do you need to go out and actually physically do something? Um, Good question. I wouldn't, <laughs> uh, I wouldn't, I, I, the bugs are going to die. Okay. The insect infestation will, will uh, fall off and die gradually. And then uh they'll just they'll just kind of you know compost okay <laughs> they'll, they'll go away that works. Uh, if i were hurt I, I would also if it says you need to reapply in in mm -hmm. six or eight weeks i would totally do that mm -hmm. particularly because scale scale's only in a crawling stage without that little cover over it for a very brief amount of time and if you can't catch it when it's in the crawler stage and spray it with a full like a spray that you spray on uh, you have to use uh, a systemic insecticide that the roots take up 
because you just can't get to them any other way. Mm-hmm. They got that's a good little armor shell they've got on there. So yeah, unless you want to um, go and flick off every single <laughs> yeah. every one. And, in spite of the quarantine, who has time for that? So yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. I would I would definitely do that. And yeah, I wouldn't worry about. It. That's a really good question, though, Tanisha. Really good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm always trying to soak it up, you know. So, uh, what's growing? We've got 30 seconds left. What is the best thing that's growing in your garden right now, Marty? Oh, well, I have, I have berry bushes that didn't die when I transplanted them because I had to transplant them. But <laughs> I'm, that's I'm a pretty win. happy, and, and my perennials are blooming. They're just really nice, really nice. Wonderful. All right, Jen, what about you? What's your favorite? Um, we picked our first cherry tomatoes and zucchini this week. So that's really exciting. And we discovered, I thought we had zero peaches on our peach trees and we found a few baby peaches. So it's not, it's not enough for a pie or anything, but Hey, it's growing in my backyard. So that's everybody gets a peach, right? (laughs) right. We've got watermelon and green beans and lettuce and all kinds of stuff. So uh, growing season is going well over here too. So thank you, We're, ladies. I've been collecting sugar snap peas about every day. Oh yeah, those two, those oh, two. So I barely make it in the house. They're so good. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for your time and talents, ladies. And thank you so much for watching. And we'll see you next time. Bye bye. <laughs>